How long does the Clipper take to get to New York? Can't tell you that. Well, about how long? Not less than five days. Might be longer. Are there any sleeping accommodations on board? No, sir. No sleeping? You mean to say we have to sit up all the way from England to New York? I'm afraid so. Well, where do we stop en route? I mean, besides Lisbon. Can't tell you that. Sorry. Are we likely to be held up on the way? <laughs> Sorry, I can't tell you that either. Well, how about this? Will I be loaded off the clipper in the middle of nowhere if somebody else comes along with a priority? <laughs> I couldn't answer that, sir. There are no guarantees about anything. Hmm. That's war travel, huh? Yes, sir. That's war travel. <laughs> The Columbia Broadcasting System presents An American in England, the last of a limited series of four programs written and directed by Norman Corwin, an extension of the transatlantic series of the same title, recently shortwaved by CBS from London. Tonight, Clipper Home, with Joseph Julian narrator and music by Lynn Murray. Step down, please. Move forward. Watch your step, please. Watch your step. There was good reason for watching your step. Because a slip would either break your neck or drop you into the Atlantic. Or both. I stepped, watchfully, from the earth of the British Isles into the tender that was taking us to the clipper. All right. Cast away. One of my fellow passengers pulled off his hat and made a circle with it over his head. Bye, O.C. Goodbye. Be good as well. Bye, Elsie! He waved at Elsie, and Elsie waved at him. The shore fell back, and we swung around toward the clipper. She loomed up big and gray, her wings spreading over half the ocean, her nose tilted up sassy and proud, the kind of pride that comes of being able to throw your weight around the sky. Big basket, isn't she? Yeah, big ship. There was an American flag painted on her side. And in the thin light of late afternoon, with white clouds loafing along in the west wind, and the bay shining, and the wooded hills darkening, and the water very much impressed and full of reflection. The clipper looked very beautiful. Her name was NC109652 or something like that. And I shall always love her. We boarded and took our seats and waited. It was the biggest plane I'd ever seen. It had a lounge and a long ascending passageway with stairs to each section. I knew only one passenger aboard, Steve Laird, correspondent for Time. He had some dope on the itinerary, and he leaned over and whispered to me, Steve said we'd reach Lisbon next morning and stay overnight at a hotel and probably leave the next afternoon. Your belt, please. Yeah. Don't I had no Elsie to say goodbye to. Just a country. And a kindly people. And guns in the park. And moonlight on the blacked out Thames. And a lot of unimportant little guys, all friends and allies of ours, who one day will add up to something very big for you and me and the rest of the world. Those were my Elsies. And I could wave goodbye to them without wiggling a finger. The ship taxied out for its run, and when everything was in order, the motors roared, and we took off like an important event. Manufacturing her own private hurricane. We were somewhere around the Bay of Biscay, where Nazi and British planes often get tangled up. But well, we'd been in the air six hours. Blackout curtains had been up for five and a half. The passengers had gone through life, time, tick, the New Yorker, punch, hunch, munch, the London Illustrated Weekly, and crunch. We were all fatigued and drooping, not from the mags, but from having been up and traveling since five that morning. Well, I knew that Lisbon lay some 600 miles to the south of England, and that its climate was warm. 
but I didn't think it was as warm as the plane was getting. I peeled off my coat and vest, loosened my collar, sat quietly roasting. And when the steward came by, I opened one eye and said, Hey. Yes, sir? Are we in the tropics already? In the tropics? Oh, we're still several hours out of Lisbon. Why? It sure gets hot in this part of the world, doesn't it? Oh, that. Uh, something's going screwy with the heating system, that's all. Don't mind it. Matter of fact, it's freezing outside. That's a big help. But as I contemplated my headache and the stiff neck and sore back, it occurred to me that no man has a right to expect anything about this war to suit his comfort or convenience. The fight against barbarism isn't a vacation cruise. And many a better man than I has done his ocean traveling on a raft without magazines or a thermostat or a boat or food or water. This war is the least the looks of all wars. There are no feather beds on the destroyers, no steam heat in the trenches or mint juleps in the desert, no air conditioning in the jungles. What the fighting men of the United Nations are up against on a hundred fronts in terms of sheer physical discomfort is enough to cast the deepest shame on any complaining civilian. Having put myself in my place, I felt better. And apparently I dozed off because the next thing I knew... 20 minutes to Lisbon. Be in Lisbon in 20 minutes. Take your overnight bags and passports with you. Don't forget your passports now. Lisbon in 20 minutes. The River Tagus was below us. Faint in the pearly light of the Portuguese night. The clipper banked. Suddenly there were the lights of Lisbon. Jeweled and twinkling. One of the passengers was all wrapped up in a window. Lights. Look at that. Good Christopher, what a stack of... Are they bright, though? Isn't that perfectly grand? Have you ever in your life seen a sight like that? Now, wait a minute now. It's not as wonderful as that, is it? Well, I don't know about you, but these are the first lights I've seen in more than three years. I've forgotten. Of course. Europe has been fighting fascism longer than we have. More than two years longer. And just a hundred miles east of those twinkling lights over the mountains, the people of Spain were fighting the fight six years ago. The Axis won that round. And that's one of the reasons there aren't so many street lamps burning in Europe tonight. We landed smoothly on the neutral Pegasus. automobile which took us from the Portuguese customs to the hotel seemed arrogant in its size, speed, the brightness of its headlights, and the raucousness of its horn. That was because we'd just come from England, where nights are quiet and dark, and headlamps show only a slit of light. Our driver tooted his horn like a man possessed. At visions, apparently, because nobody was in the streets at that hour. Even though I'd experienced only four months of blackout... The unshielded window of my room at the hotel seemed like a shocking oversight. My first impulse was to snap off the light, pull down the shade. A couple of high-spirited Lisbonians started singing in the street below. And albeit the morning was mild and the air sweet, I shut the window. It didn't help very much. I slept anyway. I awoke late and hurried to the suggestion of the hotel waiter. Café creme, alguma fruta? No, okay, huh? Two eggs. At one meal. And real cream, too. Better than the British variety. The banquet. The car is ready to leave. I was late and had to rush to the club. He's seeing little of it beyond a beating sense of antiquity and dizzy. 652 and took off. <laughs> of Portugal retreated quickly, and Lisbon, with all its refugees and spies and agents and nice Portuguese people, was lost in a mist behind a cake. The air started to get sloppy, and in no time we were in a rainstorm with visibility nil. But to make sure of the nil part of it, the blackout curtains went up anyway. 
From Portugal to West Africa involves about as much flying as from New York to Los Angeles. West Africa was where we were going, so we settled down for a long haul. After dinner, the steward spread cushions on the floor for sleeping, dragged some ale, and made me a bed under a coat rack. The vibration back there is greater because the tail's not insulated against sound and it wasn't built to sleep in. But you don't notice squeaks and rattles when you're flying through the African night with your head full of Canary Islands, Sahara Desert, and Gold Coast, and Senegal, and all the romantic names of your geography class. And while you sleep, unknown to anybody aboard, somewhere down there in the dark ocean, plowing eastward in a great armada, are thousands of your countrymen on their way to invade North Africa. The night is deep and the ocean wide. And between them, they keep the secret. Meanwhile, the stars look down, all mum. The motors stay at pitch. Coast swinging on the coat rack. The clipper burns more space. The air foams in her wake. The planet turns toward morning. You sleep on. Around you, ranging outward to all compass points, men are dying as you sleep. Dying for the rights of other men. Morning over the coast of West Africa. The sun higher and brighter at 8 a.m. than it is over London at noon. Outside the windows, which two nights ago framed the northern village, and last night the cliffs of Portugal, lay now the westward fringes of a massive continent 5,000 miles across the middle. We landed at a port called Censored, all the physical features of the place bearing the same name. Ashore, we ate a hearty breakfast and roamed around while the clipper was having a snack of gas and oil, seeing... Four words censored here. And also the pretty... Six words censored here. And we stood on the banks of the... Three words. Watching the... Two words. Until it was time to go. And we flew to another port in West Africa, also bearing a name unmentionable, for good and sufficient reason. And here, under a golden equatorial sky, with tropical trees swaying in a warm African wind... I came upon a curious item packed to the wall of a house. It read simply, Scores of Saturday's leading games as follows. Yale 17, Dartmouth 7, Princeton 32, Brown 13, Notre Dame 21, Illinois 14, Minnesota 16, Michigan 14. Inside the house, there was a jukebox playing Bing Crosby and a ping-pong table to which Steve Laird challenged me. Final score, Laird 21, me 17. It was too hot to play a return match, so we bought some soda pop and hat. While the clipper waited for cover of darkness to take off, I roamed the area, and every now and then a native would stop and look wondering at the strange white man who arrived that afternoon in the Thunderbird. What went through that simple tribal mind would be worth knowing. I wonder whether it might be something like this. Poor man. Belongs to the restless white civilization, which is always fighting. They say it's pretty terrible, too. Worse than the cannibals. This lad looks harmless enough, though. Wonder what his tribe is fighting for this time. Something obscure and intangible as usual, I suppose. If that's what was in his mind, he'd probably have a hard time understanding that the great commotion going on is something directly affecting the price he gets for coconuts, and also his chances of continuing to live the life he wants to live. Had it not been for a war between white folks 70 years ago... He might be up for auction in a slave market today. If he could ask the boys who are doing the fighting in this war, the chances... Like bread, so does the next guy. I'd like to see everybody in the world get a piece of bread and a quart of milk a day. And that goes for Indians and Eskimos and hot and tots, too. The way I figure it, this is everybody's war. That's what they say in the papers and on the radio, and that's what it is. Well, if it's everybody's war, why can't the people of Tomania build themselves a TVA on the Danube after the war if they feel like it? They're right, isn't it? Like with their own... Are the Tomanians fighting the Axis and dying so that somebody else can control their rights? 
I don't think so. Would that West African native grasp the fact that this time it's a war for various new freedoms, including freedom from the kind of malnutrition showing in his face? No doubt wouldn't understand right off the bat. But then, of course, not all the natives of North America understand yet either. We left at dusk, but in another ship. I didn't like it as much as the NC-109652, but it took off just as gracefully, plowing through the warm waters of censored and rising into the trade wind with its nose pointed straight at the bulge of South America. list had grown. It now included two Canadian officers, home on leave from a station in Arabia. Listen, friend, you don't know what heat is until you spend a summer in the Gulf of Eden. Sizzles your eyebrows. And a man and wife from our own Midwest. In the midst of World War II, she was worrying about the evil of drink spreading throughout Christian civilization. And when we got there in the morning, they served us a cold drink. And there was rum in it. Rum. They shouldn't do things like that. And a British gentleman who was on his way to China through North America. Actually, Chinese is a simple language to learn. Has many grammar in the sense we employ it. Very often you have to be circumlocutious to express an image. For example... a diplomatic uh, mail courier, American. And how'd you like a game of Michigan rummy? And assorted Frenchmen, Poles, Britons, Czechs, and Americans. We crossed the equator southward in the middle of a night of strange time and came down in the Western Hemisphere. Brazil doesn't take any chances when it comes to catching African plant diseases or any other kind of disease. So before anybody could get off the clipper after crossing the South Atlantic, the health authorities brought aboard a spray of foul-smelling insecticide and filled the ship with a heavy vapor. That was fair enough. This is the age of germicides. The big job of the century being to destroy the virus of fascism. There isn't much I can tell you about that Brazilian port and our allies there because of the long years of the Axis. But I can say I met an American army flyer there and that he was carrying a strange-looking box under his arm, and odd noises were coming from it. When I asked him what he had there... Oh, this? Tiger. He box and a gray kitten pounced out. I took him with me from New Hampshire when I was home on leave. He's been flying with me ever since. And does he like it? Loves it. Has 86 hours to his credit. Never a dull moment, eh, Tiger? Tiger was obviously an air-minded kitten. Because in a moment, he was climbing over the pilot's cap. Good old... We waited at the dock for a third change of ships. So far, we'd traveled 7,000 miles since we left London, and now we were farther from New York than when we started. Such are routine distances in a global war. So, in due course, when everything was ready... All night we flew, north by west streaking along like an apprentice meteor. We crossed the mouths of the Amazon, recrossed the equator, flew over Devil's Island, up past the steaming Guianas, and then... Two scenes censored here. And then, having made a censored stop between the South and North Americas, we set out over still another sea for the United States. By now, the passengers were real chummy. It was like a flying country club. I played cards all morning with a courier. Behind us, blackout and one egg a month, and raiders coming in low over the coast. Below us, the unruffled blue waters of the Caribbean. Ahead, Miami. By sundown, we were home. That's where you park your heart when you cross water outbound. From the moment you leave, all the roads, rails, 
channels, ship lanes, and skyways of the world point back to your own country. A number of times previously, I had come home to the States from a foreign place, and each return was happy, as a homecoming should be. But somehow this time, when we tied up at Miami, and I put my feet on Florida, there was a feeling I'd never known before. It was a feeling of having reached home long before this. The feeling of having already arrived, not just once, but two or three times. Maybe it was the sensation of lights and two eggs at one meal in Lisbon. That seemed like home. Or the football scores and jukebox in West Africa. Or the kitten from New Hampshire in Brazil. You surrender your passports here, please. Customs is down the hall. No, that wasn't it at all. It was the fact that England had seemed so much like home to me. The language, the people, the American soldiers crowding the place. Thank you. Your baggage is okay. Exit to the terminal is on the left. Yes, that was certainly a big part of it. But also, I think, it must have been a vague realization deep down that the world has shrunk, that the world will never be the same. On the streets of Miami, I met a boy I used to know in New York. He was a sallow, mousy kid when I saw him last, but now he was wearing the uniform of a private of the United States Army. He was wearing it quietly and proudly. He was married, and his wife was with him, and they were spending his leave in Miami. I'd like you to meet my wife. We got married just before I was inducted. How do you do? How do you do? His eyes were clear and confident. He stood straight without trying. He'd become a soldier since I saw him last. A man. Before very long, he'd be shooting at fascists somewhere in the world. I asked him the usual questions, how he liked being in the Army, what had happened to our mutual friends. Well, you know Perry Lafferty's in the Air Force. And, uh, uh, Charlie, well, he's up in Alaska, I think. Oh, say, you remember Alan's brother? Younger brother? Yeah, he's in India. Be darned. And uh, Jerry Rico's in the Navy. Last time I saw him, he'd just come back from Murmansk. Ah, uh, let's see what else. We went into a drugstore and bought some ice cream sodas, which I had missed keenly in England, and we talked some more. I asked why he felt he was in this war, and his answer was impressive. He never once mentioned freedom or democracy or Bill of Rights. Well, I'm fighting for home, I guess. I mean, I want to get there and get it over with and get home again and go back to work. All right, I don't mean exactly I'm fighting just for home. I mean, it wouldn't really be home, would it, if we lost? It wouldn't be the same thing anymore. It wouldn't be such a thing as home if we got licked, would there? Well, that is the kind of home and home life we're accustomed to. You understand what I mean? His wife covered his hand with hers and smiled at him. I said I understood what he meant and offered to buy them another soda that they had to leave. ...to inquire about trains to New York, and I found you couldn't get reservations as easily as when I left the States. I'd have to wait a couple of days. So I walked over to the airline's office. I could see the traffic in the streets was far below normal. A cop explained to me that gas rationing was getting stricter and the tire situation was very tough. Food, too. They were sending so much abroad. At the airline's office... Nothing today or tonight or tomorrow, but there's been a cancellation on the 9.30 plane Thursday morning, and I could put you down for that. She put me down for that. I went out and walked down to the ocean front. Four nights ago, Bay of Biscay. Today, Biscayne Bay. I found that while I'd been away, America had gone abroad. There was a boy from almost every family, either in a foreign land or almost ready to... Some folks were in every zone of time and every latitude from one pole to another. Our men and materials and energies were going out around the globe, over all the oceans, to all the continents. Yes, the world has shrunk, I told myself. America is not just 48 United States and her territories. America today is every country where free men are fighting, where people of goodwill hang out. I slept on that. Came Thursday morning, and I took the plane. 9.30 express to Jacksonville, Salamis, Charleston, Washington, and New York. Passengers will please board at gate four. All the way home, I thought about England and the clipper and the grace of the country unrolling beneath the plane. Over Georgia, I looked hard trying to locate the army camp where my brother Al was stationed. 
but we didn't fly close enough to it. Over Washington, I noticed the new war buildings were nearly finished. New York. Near bus into town, we'll find it outside gate four on the lower level. I was deep in a reverie, wondering whether, having now completed my journey, it would be possible to compress into one sentence the sum total of my observations. Whether I could state simply, in few words, what hopes I had for the future of our Earth. Something that would add together the great British people whom I'd been among, and the lights of Lisbon, and the curious natives of West Africa, and the Canadians on leave from Arabia, and the soldier in Miami, and the map of the world at the terminal in New York. I decided after a tussle that you couldn't say it in one sentence. So I gave up trying. But just as I was turning in that night, I came across some old miscellany in a closet. And among the items was a quote from Benjamin Franklin, all framed and pretty and full of dust. And I found that that day, 150 years ago, God grant that not only the love of liberty, but a thorough knowledge of the rights of man may pervade all the nations of the earth. So that a philosopher may set his foot anywhere on its surface and say... This is my country. I dusted that off and searched for a hammer and some nails, and I nailed it up on the wall, thinking it was as good a statement now as when Ben wrote it. Yes, sir. God grant that not only the love of liberty, but a thorough knowledge of the rights of man may pervade all nations of the earth, so that a philosopher may set his foot anywhere on its surface and say... This is my country. have been listening to the Columbia Broadcasting System's presentation of Clipper Home, written and directed by Norman Corwin as the last of a limited series of four programs entitled An American in England. These were an extension of the international series of the same name, originally broadcast from London. Joseph Julian, the narrator of the London productions, served in that capacity here as well. The musical score was composed, arranged, and conducted by Lynn Murray. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.